All right, here we go. Comprehensive presentation on endogenous retroviruses with several new developments. And I'm going to just get right into it because I have a lot to get through and I'm looking forward to this. Endogenous retroviruses. Ancient viral infections or created units of DNA function. Presentation by Donnie B. So as anybody knows who's who's been following this channel in this ministry, um, I put out a book several months ago, the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook. This right here is the limited edition cover, dismantling the best evidence for common descent. And throughout this book, I answer questions such as what best explains ERV-like sequences found at the same locations in the genomes of different organisms. Why do ERV elements resemble viral genetic material? What is the best explanation for the nested hierarchical distribution of endogenous retroviral-like sequences in primate genomes? And can the separate ancestry model explain endogenous retroviruses better than common descent? And the answer is yes. And anybody who has picked up the book and read the book knows exactly why. If you have not yet picked it up, I highly recommend it. It is very comprehensive and it covers all of the favorite talking points and main objections to the separate ancestry model when it comes to endogenous retroviruses. Now, currently I am working on uh, several new books and one of them being the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook Refuting the Critics. So this is an ongoing study of mine and I want to put forward the very best model of separate ancestry that there is. And it just so turns out that a lot of the so-called best evidence for evolution, like endogenous retroviruses, DNA level nested hierarchies, uh, pseudogenes, right? This claim that humans and chimpanzees share genetic mistakes, that the evolutionist camp will say that we inherited from a past common ancestor, uh, the junk DNA paradigm. It turns out that the best lines of evidence for common descent have been overturned and they belong to the creationist. And the creationists are the ones that are making the best testable predictions in the world of DNA function. And so I am working um, on a follow-up refuting the critics, just going in detail over some of the objections that I've, that I've seen and anticipated. So I am having a lot of fun with that specific book. And again, I want to make it thorough, of course. And since it's an ongoing study of mine, there's constantly new developments, new findings. And I do like to point out that we are just in the infancy of understanding the DNA language, understanding the functionality of these endogenous retroviral-like sequences. And this is something that even the secular scientists will admit in their technical papers, that there's still so much that we don't understand about ERV sequences. And that is why as a creationist who essentially expects treasure in the genome, I can make testable predictions on the function of endogenous retrovirus. And I do cover uh, quite a bit of those predictions in the, in the book itself. Um, we also here at Sanford Truth Ministries, of course, we have a, a website where you can um, access StanfordTruthMinistries.com, Defending the Truth of Biblical Creation, articles, endless videos, uh, resources. You can find all of our books on there, including the Endogenous Retrovirus Handbook. Uh, we do have two channels currently. The primary one where we do all our debates, lectures, interviews, so on and so forth, Standing for Truth. And then uh, Young Earth Creation, where we do a lot of original material. And we also do uh, re-upload a lot of our 
uh, past content for people. We, we just want to reach as many people as possible. So between those two channels, we have over 30,000 subscribers um, currently. So the question is, do endogenous retroviruses or is the existence of endogenous retroviral-like sequences that are shared among um, different organisms, are those better explained by the creation model or the evolution model? But the first thing I want to point out is there's oftentimes a problem with the word evolution itself because when the evolutionist typically uses that word, what they, what they mean by it is universal common ancestry. Universal common ancestry essentially says that all life is related. Plants, animals, we all go back to a last universal common ancestor. Okay. By that, we as creationists, we don't believe that. But if by evolution you mean dogs, wolves, coyotes are related, a variety that we see in dogs, then of course we don't have an issue with that. A basic bi uh, definition of evolution, biologically speaking, is a change in allele frequencies in populations over generations or just change over time. You'll often hear people say, you know, cell phones have changed over time. Computers have evolved over time. And so, yes, we don't have a problem with that. Change over time, of course, we see change. And the biblical model expects change. We don't uh, believe in the fixity of species. We don't believe that genomes are static. We believe that genomes are ever-changing based on pre-existing built-in algorithms, which I am going to uh, touch on in this presentation. So... If by evolution you mean change over time, change in allele frequencies and populations over generations, then yes, we're not going to have an issue. But if you believe, if by evolution you mean what we see here in terms of the fairy tale, that whales, mosquitoes, wolves, dogs, banana plants, strawberries are related through common ancestry, then that's where we're going to have the problem. Because that's not science, that's not observable, that's not empirical. Okay, so we just want to make that clear. And when it comes to the biblical creation model, model or the biblical model of ancestry, we would hold to what's called independent origins or separate ancestry, which essentially says that God would have created distinct kinds of creatures in the beginning. The Bible makes it clear that God in the beginning created two people, Adam and Eve. And he created separate kinds. So we have Adam and Eve, for example, humans that are separately created, independently created from all other forms of life. So we have humans with a separate ancestry than, say, the great apes, chimpanzees, bonobos, and of course, a separate ancestry from a pine tree or whales. Whereas the universal common ancestry model would say, all primates are related, all mammals are related, all vertebrates are related, all plants and animals are basically related. Okay, so here's here's just a, um, a picture here that I think um, makes the point nicely, where we have humans, homo sapiens down here, and we've been able to actually separate humans from every other form of life. And we can stick to as close to home as possible. We can stick with what the evolutionary community believes is our closest cousin. They believe that humans, us, and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. We did not come from chimpanzees. What they'll say is chimpanzees and humans go back to a common ancestor between 6 and 10 million years ago. So therefore, the chimpanzee is our closest living relative. And we would say, no, the hu humans and chimpanzees aren't related. And so if we can demonstrate that through empirical scientific data, that humans and chimpanzees aren't related, well, that completely decimates the universal tree of life. Because if humans and chimpanzees aren't related, then guess what? 
humans and strawberries definitely are not related. So we can stick as close to home as possible and just absolutely destroy universal common ancestry or common descent. Because, and this is a whole presentation for another day. I've written books on it, done debates on it. But we can look to the mitochondrial DNA. We can look to the Y chromosome. We can look to linkage blocks. We can look to uh, DNA function. And we can determine that humans are not related to any other form of life. They are specially created and in the image, made in the image of God. Um, so the separate ancestry model would say that God would have created Adam and Eve, but based on the uh, Bible's command to be fruitful and multiply, it wouldn't make any sense to believe that God meant that, be fruitful and multiply, to be carried out through cloning. Okay, God did not create Adam and Eve as homozygous clones. And homozygous just essentially means a state of no DNA diversity. Okay, so that would indicate that Adam and Eve would have produced clones of themselves with no built-in diversity. So we put forth a model call, called the design diversity hypothesis or the created heterozygosity hypothesis. Heterozygosity just means a state of DNA differences, a, a state of DNA variety, DNA diversity. Okay. And it, it goes back to this basic genetics where you have capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. So in the created heterozygosity model, you would have capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b, right? That means you're genetically heterozygous. And you would have that all throughout the genome in various positions. Do that all throughout the genome. You'd have the potential for incredible variation and morphological adaptability because the DNA differences are already built in. Therefore, all that's required is recombination, shuffle up those pre-existing designed variants, and you can get new chromosomal combinations quickly since the DNA variety is built in. Rather than <clears throat> capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, which means you would be homozygous, Adam and Eve would have been capital A, lowercase a, capital B, lowercase b. They would have been uh, created heterozygous. That's why today a couple could have essentially a million kids if it were possible, and no two kids would be genetically identical because we today have built in heterozygosity. We today have built in genetic information. And this, of course, would apply universally among kinds. Humans and kinds would have been front-loaded with pre-existing DNA differences. You'd have DNA differences within. You'd have DNA differences across. And through processes like recombination gene conversion, you can get new chromosomal combinations each generation. And recombination is basically a process by which pieces of DNA are broken and recombine to produce what? New combinations of alleles. And since you have design variants at creation, you can get new combinations of alleles quickly. You don't need millions of years to build up the necessary DNA diversity for recombination to produce new combinations of alleles. Evolution requires deep time, millions of years to build up the necessary DNA diversity that can be basically called upon by natural selection. Natural selection is a fine tuning process. It's not a creative process that adds anything new. It works with that which already exists. It keeps a species as strong as it can be, basically, natural selection, okay? Mutations to the evolutionist provide the raw genetic material the new DNA diversity that natural selection can act upon and that recombination can essentially swap DNA information between chromosomes to create new combinations of alleles every generation, scramble up those DNA differences that are built up through mutations. But we understand that mutations 
are the destroyer and not the creator. Mutations don't add anything novel and meaningful. They don't add the type of beneficial diversity that design diversity would have. The type of uh, diversity, for the most part, that you get through deleterious mutations, harmful deleterious mutations, are, are the kinds of diversity you get on your car. When you get a new car, you drive it off a lot, your car is looking pristine, and you go to the grocery store, the mall, and you park too close to somebody. You go into the mall, you come back, and, and somebody smacked your car with their door. Well... Your car is more diverse. You got a ding. Over time, you get dents, dings, rust, rust spots. Sure, your, your, your car <laughs> is more diverse, but this isn't beneficial diversity. Mutations are damaging. They're harmful. They're disease caused. One single point mutation can kill an individual. And the majority of mutations are actually effectively neutral. So they build up over time. They're invisible to selection. They're damaging. They're low impact. They're deleterious. They're subject to genetic drift. And so they escape natural selection and they lead to genetic sickness over time. And that is why design diversity makes sense because it allows for beneficial diversity to be acted upon by natural selection. See, the creations, we look back in time to the expansion of genetic information. And over time, through shifts in heterozygosity, right, more genetic diversity or allelic variability, to homozygosity, a state of lesser DNA variety or allelic variability. Species hit walls. You can get new species quickly after creation, after the flood, but over time, you lose DNA variety. A wolf to a chihuahua is essentially a downward process where fewer design variants will be available because you're going from greater states of heterozygosity to lower states of heterozygosity, which means more homozygosity, which again is it would be a state of no DNA diversity. So recombination, this recombination process creates a genetic diversity at the level of genes that reflects differences in the DNA sequences of different organisms. The evolutionary model, they look back to the contraction of genetic information. They go back billions of years to that first single-celled like ancestor that evolved into the first multi-celled ancestor, which evolved into a fish, an amphibian, a reptile, a mammal, a primitive mammal, right? A monkey and a human. That requires the expansion of genetic variability. That requires novel systems, new body plans, increases in phenotypic complexity. So that's why they need to look back to the contraction. We look back to the expansion, which makes sense. Now, on to the main topic. Endogenous retroviruses are not evidence for common descent, and we are going to see exactly why. And what I just described in terms of created heterozygosity, design diversity, plays a huge part, huge part in the overall explanation for endogenous retroviruses. Because as you're going to see, the evidence not only suggests that God would have front-loaded the original created kinds with pre-existing functional DNA diversity, but also with functional DNA elements that have a variety of important, essential, and critical roles. And a few of these DNA elements would be ALU sequences, which we'll touch on a bit, these ERV sequences, and other classes of retrotransposons, including pseudogenes, we know now are necessary to sustain healthy life process, uh, processes in the cell. So we are going to go over some of the some of the details here in terms of endogenous retroviruses. And um, I want to point out because we understand, and anybody who's watched my uh, lectures, presentations, debates, we understand that these endogenous retrovirus elements 
have incredibly important functional roles. And evolution, evolutionary scientists, they'll claim that over millions of years, what has happened is we have actually co-opted several retrovirus sequences to have become firmly fixed in our genome. And throughout the millions of years, these sequences have been cleaned up through mutations. Mutations clean them up. Okay, as they make their way into the germ cell line and they're passed on, mutations are supposed to clean them up. And the infectious part of the retrovirus is then eliminated. Okay. And eventually, what they'll say is that these herb sequences can become functional. Okay. And these herb sequences, they represent 8% of the human genome, they're a very important component of the human genome. Herbs are incorporated into the genome through the invasion of infectious retroviruses. Basically, endogenous retroviruses are small pieces of DNA that are found within the genomes of many creatures. Okay, they're present in a great multitude of species, not just humans and primates, but a great multitude of, of species. These infectious retroviruses have infected, this is the evolutionary story, our distant ancestors and made their way into the germ cells. This means the next generation will have the integrated genome of the infectious virus. And this is in every one of the individual cells. And I wanna point out to retroviruses, they're a special type of virus, okay? There's different kinds of viruses. Overall, when it comes to viruses in general, viruses are good. We have more viruses in and on our bodies than we do cells. And we have 100 trillion cells, approximately. And viruses, you wouldn't want to live in a world without viruses, put it that way. Viruses are regulating, they're controlling. And in terms of our bodies, viruses are controlling the number of bacterial species because we have a lot of uh, bacteria as well good bacteria some bad bacteria and viruses are regulating the amount of um, bacteria we have they work in in the immune system the ecosystem and again you wouldn't want to live in a world without viruses so 99 percent of viruses are good but sometimes through degeneration the crossing of species among other reasons, they can go from good to bad. Okay, you'll find that a lot of bad viruses, harmful infectious viruses, are actually normal and how and good in their original uh, host. It's when they cross species, they burn hot and fast. The species that they've crossed into and infected can't control or regulate the um, integrated virus. Okay, so here's um, here's a source here. Infection of a host cell by an exogenous retrovirus causes the integration of retroviral DNA into the host genome. In a case of germ cell infection, it would have to get through vertically through the germ cell lines, okay, in order to be passed on to the next generation. So the inserted retroviral DNA can be subsequently inherited in a Mendelian fashion, and they are then termed endogenous retroviruses. Again, endogenous retroviral elements comprise approximately 8% of the human genome. And um, these pieces of DNA are found within a great multitude of, of creatures. But that's why, again, the most important question is going to be throughout this presentation is, are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections, fossil viruses, essentially? Or are they created units of DNA function? Again, right here, according to the standard evolutionary story of endogenous retroviruses, an herb is a stretch of DNA found in your DNA that got there when one of your ancestors was infected by a virus, according to the evolution story. They're expected to be the remnants of ancestral infections of primates by active retroviruses and have thereafter been transmitted in a Mendelian Fashion. Proponents of common ancestry believe that herb elements are the ancient remnants of past viral infections, as we've gone over. And that's why they'll oftentimes um, refer to these sequences as fossil viruses. And that's why they look to the uh, organization or placement of endogenous retroviruses in the biological world as a, a historical record. Human endogenous retroviruses, HERV. So when you see the H, 
next to the herb, it's a human, okay? Human endogenous retrovirus. And we have um, different families of, of herbs, essentially. Herb H, Herb K, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into those a little bit later in terms of uh, some of these details. Okay, retroviruses, though, I want to point out is because we have many different kinds of viruses. Retroviruses specifically are a special type of virus and they have an RNA genome. Okay, they're an RNA virus and they can actually convert that RNA uh, genome and genetic material into DNA and then insert it into the cell's genome in a process called reverse transcription. DNA, RNA to protein in reverse transcription, just think about transcription in reverse. <laughs> Right now you've got DNA to RNA to protein or RNA to DNA, which the retrovirus has to do. It has to convert its RNA genome into DNA in order to uh, integrate or insert itself into the uh, cell's genome. And um, again, they'll refer to these as, as fossil viruses. Evolutious acknowledge that for the most part, the reserve sequences, the infections would have occurred millions of years ago. Now, why I say most is because there's going to be an aspect of this whole debate where we have fixed herb sequences. Fixed just means stuck in place. Everybody has these herb sequences. They're fixed in the human population. Or unfixed. Unfixed would be they're not stuck in place. Only certain individuals within the greater population have them. Okay. For example, there's many single point mutations that only subpopulations have. Blue eyes is a mutation and not every single human being has that mutation. Only a certain subset of the population does. It's not fixed. So evolutionists acknowledge that most of these herb sequences would have occurred millions of years ago. Now, I want to point out... <laughs> The reason, a big reason why the evolutionist camp believes that these herb sequences are such good evidence for evolution, fish to fisherman evolution, that is, is because they look to these genetic fossils and they'll point out the fact that we share a lot with the chimpanzees. Okay, they, they fall out into a nested hierarchy. What that means basically is we share more of these herb sequences with the chimpanzee than we do with, let's say, a gorilla or an orangutan or a lemur. So we share more with the chimpanzee than we do with other uh, creatures that are less similar to us and according to the evolutionary model is more distantly related to us. So they, they fall out into these groups within groups patterns. And they'll say that the chances of two herbs being inserted at the same exact location in separate organisms that aren't related is very small. Because remember, the Croatius puts forth the separate ancestry model. We wouldn't say that humans and chimpanzees are, are related. So the evolutionists are going to say, well, then that means if these really are the ancient remnants of, of past viral infections, the chances of being hit with the same herb or the same retrovirus, which eventually... see. Endogenous means it, it's occurring from within, originating from within, okay? Rather than the exogenous retrovirus like HIV, which which will um, infect from outside. So essentially, we're invaded over millions of years by exogenous retroviruses. Some of them manage to get through vertically rather than horizontally. Vertically rather than horizontally, they're getting through the germ cell lines. So they'll say the chances of two herbs being inserted at the exact same location in separate organisms is very small. Very unlikely, they'll say. And they'll argue that the chance of a human and a chimpanzee being infected in the exact same spot by the same specific type of virus is far less than one in 10 million. And of course, to the evolutionists, that's highly unlikely. To them, that's strong evidence that these shared viral elements were inherited from a past common ancestor. Okay. Um, and, and of course, the, the, to them, the more shared herb sequences, the more unlikely it becomes. Because then instead of one in 10 million, it's one in 100 million, one in a billion chance, the more that you have shared. 
okay, to have uh, inserted independently. But again, that's why it goes back to this question, are these really the ancient remnants of past viral infections or are they created units of DNA function? Because as we're going to see here that they are, if they are created units of DNA function, then the fact that we find shared created units of DNA function across many organisms in the biological world is not a surprise. That's what the common design model would expect. And um, again, they would point to the nested hierarchical arrangement of them as well, which we will uh, get into a little bit later. Okay. So relics of ex exogenous retroviral infection. Endogenous retroviruses, herbs, are relics of exogenous retroviral infections of germ cells that result in integration of proviral DNA into the host genome. So here's some important questions that I want to uh, answer throughout this, this presentation. Why are there herb sequences shared between the genomes of organisms, right? Do evolutionists have a point when they say that... Um, shared herb elements are indicative of common descent. If viral-like sequences in the genomes of organisms are functional, why do they bear similarity to viral genetic material? What best, uh, What is the best explanation for the nested hierarchical distribution of endogenous retroviral-like sequences in primate genomes? And can the separate ancestry model explain the data better than the common descent model? Um, Here's where I, where I want to continue with the details, but I want to go over some really fascinating um, facts of endogenous retroviruses, okay? Because one family of retrovirus known as HERV H, okay, human endogenous retrovirus H, HERV H, um, strongly influences our growth, development, and our genetic code. In general, ERV sequences function in gene expression, gene regulation, cell differentiation, okay? They function in the immune system, cell stress responses, embryological development. But I want to focus specifically on uh, HERV age because um, essentially without some of these herbs, these families of herbs, we couldn't exist. We couldn't exist. Now, I want to look to the placenta for a minute here. The placenta is an essential biological structure for the development of a human being. It has different structures that allow for the continual circulation between mother and baby. Nutrients, gases, and certain waste products are all circulated from mother to baby based on the structure of the placenta. Okay, so for a brief quantity of time, embryonic cells are what's called pluripotent, which basically just means that they can become multiple different types of cells. And our bodies, okay, as humans and just mammals in general, our bodies require certain types of cells in certain types of places for normal development, for normal development. This ensures our heart, muscles, brain, lungs, so on and so forth, end up developing in the best possible places in the appropriate spots, okay? Normal development. And instructions in the genome actually tell the cells, or if you're if you're alive today, you're 33 like me, okay, instructions of the genome told the cells what kind of tissues to permanently become. And Herv K, fascinatingly, marked our cells as pluripotent and made sure they remained in that state. They made sure that they remained in that state. And this would prevent them from turning into muscle or skin cells for just a little bit longer than they would otherwise. Okay, so if HERV H is keeping cells pluripotent for longer, it means those genes are expressed longer as well. And so the point is, this so-called ancient viral fossil has a massive impact on embryological development. As in, without it, you wouldn't exist. I wouldn't exist. And I know we like to exist. And not only that, HERV H also seems to have a responsibility in influencing heart cell development. Our bodies would literally 
firstly, we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be the same without these endogenous retroviruses. But chances are we wouldn't exist. And there's another um, family as well called HERV-K. And that helps embryos develop a built-in immune system. That without it, the baby would not be able to fight off pathogens from the outside world. Okay, the HERV-K is, is necessary, just like HERV-H, because this built-in immune system in the embryo keeps the baby secure even before they develop antibodies. This is before they develop antibodies. They have this built-in immune system because of an endogenous retrovirus. And this keeps them safe from outside pathogens. All right, so this is just a couple. I mean, we have endogenous retroviruses that are positively affecting our pluripotency. They help our immunity as an embryo, and they also play a foremost role in making sure we develop into a full-grown baby. And this is where I want to touch on the placenta in, in detail, okay? This is a tough word <laughs> right here. The syncytiotrophoblast is the primary structure that determines which substances cross the placenta, example, nutrients and oxygen, and which substances do not, maternal hormones and certain toxins. In the early stage of development, humans, okay, we, we develop this structure called the placenta. And a placenta, it, it's, a, it, it's a temporary organ. It's a temporary part of us that arises during pregnancy. And this structure is vital for ordinary and healthy pregnancy. So it, it's a structure, a temporary structure in the woman that needs to connect to the embryo. The placenta, it secretes a protein that binds to the embryo which keeps the two connected for the next several months of uh, embryological de de development. There's a lot that goes on in these developmental windows, okay? And a lot of these ERV sequences, they're turned on and they act in determining cell types, cell differentiation, cell migration. And a lot of the times when they're done their jobs, they're turned off. A lot of them are turned off. So if they're not turned back on, back on or active in the life of the individual, the evolutionists, because they have this junk DNA assumption, they're going to assume that these elements or sequences are non-functional junk, evolutionary leftover, fossil viruses. When that is extremely pseudoscientific, it's extremely premature, it's unsophisticated. No, a lot of ERV sequences, just like pseudogenes, are only expressed under certain conditions, certain environmental uh, windows, the developmental windows and, and environmental um, conditions, okay? So again, the placenta, okay, this structure is vital. It's critical for ordinary and healthy pregnancy. It provides nutrition to the developing baby, as we can see here, and it also helps to get rid of, of waste. And for the, for the placenta to work, this important structure has to be connected to the baby. So we have an endogenous retrovirus that is key to embryological development and placental function. This is amazing stuff. And the DNA that actually makes up the protein, okay, is very similar to a region of a retrovirus that allows the virus to attach to its host cell. And without endogenous retroviruses like the placenta, which is critical to pregnancy and embryological development, we, we, we wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Placental function wouldn't work. We wouldn't develop. We would basically not exist. These functional DNA elements, these created units of DNA function, are essential for life. They're necessary. And endogenous retroviruses 
Okay. They don't just assist in embryological development and embryonic immune systems. They also work in our immune systems after we are born. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Okay. So right here, for example, the fusion of trophoblastic cells constitutes a key process for normal placental development. Fusion in the placenta is facilitated by syncytin 1 and syncytin 2. And these syncytins arose from retroviral sequences that entered the... See how they have this assumption. No matter how essential the functional role is, like embryological development, they assume that these arose millions of years ago. They were co-opted. The functions were evolved somehow. Okay, because what they'll say is they'll argue that the uh, elements, they've actually contributed new genes to, to the human genome. And that's what this syncytin is, okay? Syncytin is basically a co-opted to the evolutionary story, uh, ENV protein, right? You got the LTR, the LTR stands for long terminal repeats, which we'll talk about, gag, pole, and ENV genes, the envelope protein. Okay, so they'll say that syncytin is a, a co-opted ENV protein. And um, so they'll argue that herb elements basically have contributed new genes. They've, they've comp contributed new genes that, that can lead to these uh, essential functional roles. All right. And that's why I pointed out just a little bit earlier in how um, when, it, when it comes to placental function, embryological development in general, the DNA that, that makes up the protein, it's very similar to a region of, of the retrovirus that actually allows the virus to attach to its host cell. Because remember, that protein that the placenta secretes, okay, it's a protein that bi it binds it to the embryo, basically. And that's how the two can uh, re remain connected during the, the next several months of, of development, okay? But remember, this is all storytelling. There's no empirical evidence for this. But they have to assume that millions of years ago, there was this co-option or the herb elements are, are contributing new genes that, that can basically be utilized for these essential roles to the point if we don't have them, we won't exist. <laughs> Okay, so I just want to make that clear. So, syncytin proteins maintain cell to cell fusogenic activity based on ENV gene mediated viral cell entry, right? Just as I was pointing out. In this review, we summarize how syncytins and their receptors are involved in fusion events during human reproduction. But uh, basically, if <laughs> without these ERV sequences, we couldn't exist. Okay, we, we, we couldn't exist. Embryonic develop, development. There is a particular class of endogenous retroviral sequences in humans that are transcribed in the very early stages of embryonic development. They are performing an antiviral re responsibility guarding a very susceptible embryo from viral infiltration. They're also playing a regulatory role. They're activating specific genetic programs that are required for the initial stages of embryological development and the process of cell migration and cell differentiation. Guess what? Other forms of life, believe it or not, like the chimpanzee, require embryological development or else they wouldn't exist. So if we, for example, have shared ERV sequences that function in embryological development, or they are safeguarding our bodies against microbes and other viruses. They're acting in the immune system, cell stress responses, determining cell types. Then guess what? It's not a shocker that we share them in, in similar spots since we have similar functions. Okay. Both creatures, both humans and chimpanzees require an immune system to fight off microbes and, and viruses require DNA elements that assist and have roles in gene expression, gene regulation, determining cell types. And of course, embryological development or else chimpanzees wouldn't exist or mice. During these knockout tests, they, they knock out a, an ERV sequence 
and the, the, the mouse is developing, you knock it out, snip it out or turn it off. And then the mouse stops developing. It dies because it requires the ERV or the retrotransposon to development, to, to develop in, in the first place. Okay. They're activating specific genetic programs that are required for the initial stages of embryological development and the process of cell migration and differentiation, cell differentiation. Here's a, an important point that I kind of touched on earlier. If you were to test the activity of these sequences in adulthood, one might erroneously conclude that these sequences were non-functional. Just because a DNA sequence or DNA element is not active at a certain time does not at all mean that it is not functional. It's, it's kind of like this. You have a car and you have a spare tire in the back of your car. You're not always using it. It's sitting there. It looks redundant. It's not being utilized. But if the opportunity arises where it needs to be used, let's say you get a flat tire, then, then now it's useful. Or your backup camera or your airbags. Okay. Your backup camera, if you're not using it, if you don't need to back up, then it's turned off. To the evolutionist, that's junk. It's, it's not there for a reason. It's just a waste. No, it's there for a reason. It's just not turned on. And that's how a lot of these non-coding uh, RNA genes are, like pseudogenes. They're only um, active or functional under certain conditions. And same with the ERV sequences. Okay, so just because a DNA sequence or DNA element is not active at a certain time does not at all mean that it is not functional. Even many non-coding RNA genes, such as pseudogenes, are only functional under certain conditions. Once development is completed, many important genes and DNA elements, for, uh, for example, this specific class of endogenous retrovirus, are turned off or are no longer active. Evolutionists need to be very cautious about proclaiming. They're oftentimes premature. That's why they always have egg on their face. Because they use arguments from pseudogenes, ALU sequences, shared ALU sequences, um, and shared ERV sequences. And then we find out, which they did not predict, that these DNA elements are essential and they are necessary to sustain healthy life processes in the cell, basically. Okay. If a sequence is only functional during a very restricted time for a biological organism and its life, then one must understand that extensive testing must be done to establish that which is functional and that which is non-functional. A lot of the so-called junk DNA we understand and can predict more and more is active in these various developmental windows, going from you know zygote to, to full-grown baby. There are so many developmental windows where... Um, the body and instructions are, are given for structures and, and their, their appropriate placement. And again, cell differentiation, migration, so on and so forth. Okay. So you would, you would need almost unlimited sensitivity to conclude with any level of certainty that, that a certain sequence or element is not functional since a lot of it is redundant. A lot of it's turned off. A lot of it's used for, uh, Epi epigenetics. We have millions of genetic switches just waiting to be turned on via environment. Okay, so here is, um, I want to go over some of the details in terms of the structure of the, of the ERV. Okay, because the structure of the ERV sequence or the endogenous retroviruses match modern retroviruses. And this is what the evolutionist likes to point to again as, as more evidence for their, their um, theory here. So the structure of herbs match modern retroviruses. For example, um, HIV is a modern exogenous retrovirus. And as on both ends, as you'll see here, get my cursor, uh, are the uh, LTRs, long terminal repeats. And in between the LTRs, what we have is the gag, the pole. Okay, the pole um, actually codes for the reverse transcriptase. Right, we were talking about earlier how um, these retroviruses, they have RNA as, as their genetic material. And through reverse transcription, they require the uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme to uh, convert it, the RNA genome, 
into DNA and then integrate, which they use another enzyme called uh, integrase, uh, integrate into the um, cell's genome. And uh, again, if they integrate and in fact in a germ cell line, that's where uh, hypothetically they can be passed on vertically and become an endogenous retrovirus. So you've got the gag, the pole, and then you have the ENV. Then you have the ENV, the envelope protein, which actually codes for the envelope that makes up the body of the virus. And these structures are common in both endogenous retroviruses and retroviruses. So this is another layer to their argument. You know, why do endogenous retroviruses resemble exogenous retroviruses? Why do they nest? If you wanted to look at, um, I guess, phylogenetics, why do they nest with uh, exogenous retroviruses? They'll say it's because they're the ancient remnants of uh, retroviruses that basically over millions of years, right? They infected, integrated over millions of years mutations, okay? They, they um, deactivated the infectious part of, of the uh, retrovirus. And now basically they um, exist in biological organisms, okay? And the ENV here, the envelope um, protein, these proteins can produce proteins from the human genome, okay? Which prior to the co-option, the evolutionists will say, uh, this envelope protein was utilized to infect the host cell, right? So it's, it's bad basically before it infects. Once it infects, if it does get passed on, then over time, the bad part of it is, is removed or deactivated. So again, we've got the LTRs, the GAG, the pole, the uh, ENV, and these structures are present in both endogenous retroviruses and retroviruses. The pole gene encodes viral enzymes such as reverse transcriptase and integrase, right? Necessary to reverse transcribe RNA to DNA and integrate. Okay, that are needed for transcription of the viral RNA into double stranded DNA and integration of the DNA produced by reverse transcriptase into the host genome, respectively. All right, so this is where I want to now get into the origin of RNA viruses. And this is where it gets interesting because we understand that RNA viruses require a host to replicate. So what came first, the host or the RNA virus? This is a dilemma that the evolutionist has, but not really a dilemma that the creationist has. Okay, so I, I touch on this in my book in great detail. And this is going to be interesting because uh, Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, who critiqued my book and failed to address the major arguments in it, but also just kind of hand waved away this section in my book by just saying, oh, you know, this is a really wacky idea. It's nonsensical. But there's something funny about that, that you, that you guys are going to see soon, that the, the secular scientific community, okay, PhD virologist, which he is, so I'm surprised he doesn't know this, actually hold to an escape hypothesis, basically that says that RNA viruses may have actually originated within the host, which is exactly what I'm saying, okay? With obviously um, some distinctions, because we would say that uh, most, you could say the fixed herbs were front loaded. And RNA viruses would have come from, oh, you know, how come herbs resemble exogenous retroviruses? Well, if the exogenous retroviruses came from, they were escapees of the human genome, which contains these herb sequences, then it's not a surprise. OK, but that's not the only answer. This is this is just an interesting hypothesis that I do want to touch on. Um, OK, so the findings of the new biology demonstrate that mainstream scientists are wrong regarding the idea that transposable elements are the selfish remnants of ancient invasions by RNA viruses. Instead, RNA viruses originate from transposable elements that were designed as a variation inducing genetic elements, the vige or the um, 
V-I-G-E hypothesis. Created kinds were deliberately front-loaded. So remember at the beginning, I talked about design diversity, created heterozygosity, that Adam and Eve and the original created kinds would have been front-loaded or built in with pre-existing diversity that could then be utilized, okay, to produce new variety. Um, basically, you'd have a lot of recessive built-in traits that could become manifested later on, revealing novel phenotypes that are not due to evolution since those design variants were already pre-existing, pre-existing design uh, variants that could basically be in compressed form, decompressed, revealing new traits um, that are not novel and meaningful in the large scale fish to fisherman evolutionary sense. Because again, they're already built in, they're already uh, front loaded into the genome. Now they're just being revealed, okay? So this also goes for the, and uh, and also I, I appreciate uh, the patience of the listener as I've got a bit of allergies uh, during this show, but I'm doing my best here. So anyways, creative kinds were deliberately front loaded with several types of controlled and regulated transposable elements. So we also have the front loading of these DNA elements like transposable elements to allow them to rapidly invade and adapt to all corners and crevices of the earth. Due to the redundant character of VIGEs or VIG, again, variation inducing genetic element, which I've got paper after paper, where the secular evolutionary community actually agrees that these transposons, these transposable elements can induce vari uh, variation and that variation could be passed on. Due to the redundant character of, uh, of I, uh, VIGEs, their controlled regulation may have readily deteriorated, and some of them may now merely cause havoc. The VIG hypothesis provides elegant explanations for several biological observations that may otherwise be difficult to interpret within the creationist framework. And it works beautifully because, again, the Evolutionist has a paradox. They have a chicken and egg problem because RNA viruses require a host to replicate. So it makes sense that the host is here. God front loads the original created kinds with many types and classes of functional DNA elements, including these ERV sequences and other classes of retrotransposons. And because of the fall, because of degeneration, because of errors in the packaging process or in recombination, bam, you get a virus and it escapes the cell and it can jump to another species and boom, you got a full-blown um, infectious virus, okay? And that's why you can see that these viruses are not really made up of, of a whole lot of genes. And those genes originate from the host, okay? Um, but we're going to get a little bit more into that here. So again, uh, including the origin of diseases, RNA viruses, and chromosome rearrangements. The VIG hypothesis may be a framework for extended creationist research programs. And that's what I'm working on. RNA viruses have emerged from variation-inducing genetic elements, herbs, lines, and signs long interspersed nuclear elements and short interspersed nuclear elements, okay, are the, because you, what you have is you have LTR type retrotransposons, okay? We also have non-LTR retrotransposons. So you do have different classes of retrotransposons here, but all have function. All have a documented function that are essential, critical. Okay, a lot of them are redundant, yes, but a lot of them have essential functional roles are the genetic ancestors of RNA viruses. Darwinists are wrong in promoting herbs as remnants of invasions of RNA viruses. It is the other way around. In my opinion, this view is supported by several recent observations. RNA viruses contain functional genetic elements that help them to reproduce like a molecular machine. Usually an RNA virus contains only a handful of genes, right? As I pointed out. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, the agent that causes AIDS contains only eight or nine genes. Where did these genes come from? An RNA world? Well, that doesn't work, right? Because again, 
the RNA virus requires a host. From space? No, the most parsimonious answer is the RNA viruses got their genes from their hosts. And it can actually be demonstrated, okay? This is an ongoing project. We can actually demonstrate that most RNA viruses are built of genetic information directly related to that of their host, and we can track the virus back to its original host. For example, before HIV was HIV in humans, it was SIV in chimpanzees, which I, be I believe actually came, originated from uh, mice or um, some kind of rodent. But don't quote me on that one. Um, I got to double check that one. So where did origi uh, the viruses originate from? Notice this. Nature.com. So now we're going to compare what I just went over with the various hypotheses coming from the secular side. Contemplating the origins of life fascinates both scientists and the general public. Understanding the evolutionary history of viruses may shed some light on this inter interesting topic. So I've read paper upon paper and tons of articles on this, on how uh, naturalistic evolutionists, the evolutionary community explains the origin of viruses. And they admit there's a ton of controversy in every single one of their uh, hy uh, hypotheses. So their hypotheses that they have, there's problems. They don't know. Okay. They're putting forth ideas and uh, some are better than others. Notice here, to date, no clear explanation for the origin or origins of viruses exist. Viruses may have risen, uh, arisen. Notice this, guys. Viruses may have arisen from mobile genetic elements that gain the ability to move between cells. They may be descendants of previously li free living organisms that adapted a parasitic replication strategy. And then of course, perhaps viruses existed before and led to the evolution of cellular life. Okay, so they're, they're continuing studies here. Viruses from cells. This process very closely mirrors the movement of an important though somewhat unusual component of most eukaryotic genomes, retrotransposons. These mobile genetic elements make up an astonishing 42% of the human genome and can move within the genome via an RNA intermediate. Like retroviruses, certain classes of retrotransposons the viral-like retrotransposons encode a reverse transcriptase and often an integrase. We talked about this earlier. With the, these enzymes, these elements can be transcribed into RNA, reverse transcribed into DNA, and then integrated into a new location within the genome. So these elements, these designed elements within the genome can move around, which is why the integrase, the reverse transcriptase is... Um, it is very important. And they would actually leave uh, the same types of scars that we see, um, the same types of scars that, that we see in, in the genomes that the evolutionists want to say, these are all examples of integration from outside the genome. When in fact, no, you're going to get the same signatures when these mobile elements move around within the genome. Okay then integrated in a new location within the genome. They can do this through copy and paste means or even cut and paste. We can speculate that the acquisition of a few structural proteins could allow the element to so exit a cell and enter a new cell, thereby, become, thereby becoming an infectious agent. So it wasn't an infectious agent previously, but it became one. And it looks like it became one from within the genome. Indeed, the genetic structures of retroviruses and viral-like retrotransposons show remarkable similarities, and that's my point, okay? It makes sense, the variation-inducing genetic element hypothesis that says that these could be escapees. Notice this, where did viruses come from? Let's talk science, not a young earth creationist website. Viruses might have come from broken pieces of genetic material inside early cells. Let's see that again. Viruses might have come from broken pieces of genetic material inside early cells. What are we saying in our hypothesis? Well, genomes were front-loaded 
The original created kinds were front loaded with design diversity, of course, but also various classes of retrotransposons and through degeneration, uh, degenerative processes or errors in the packaging process. Guess what? A truly infectious virus could come about. These pieces were able to escape their original organism and infect another cell. In this way, they evolved into viruses. Modern day retroviruses like the human immunodeficiency virus, again, the HIV virus, work in much the same way. After they enter a cell, they combine their genetic material with the host genetic material. Viruses require a host, refuting the virus first hypothesis. Even many secular evolutionary scientists disagree with the, vir the virus first hypothesis. Notice this. Three general theories have been proposed to explain the origin of viruses. The virus first hypothesis states that viruses predated cells and contributed to the rise of cellular life. A significant proportion of the viral genomes encode for genetic sequences that lack clear cellular homologs. Presence of such virus-specific sequences provides support to their unique origin. Contrastingly, all known viruses need Notice this, I was saying this earlier, need a cellular host to replicate, thus necessitating the existence of what? Cells before virus survival. Perfectly consistent with the creation model here that I'm putting forth. Therefore, the virus first hypothesis has been challenged. Oh, yes, it has. And the existence of an ancient and independent viral world critiqued. It doesn't work. A third prevalent hypothesis. The escape hypothesis suggests that viruses were once part of the genetic material of host cells, but escaped cell control and later evolved by pickpocketing genes via horizontal gene transfer. Escape hypothesis is the best hypothesis. The virus first hypothesis has not really been given much credit since it does not appear to take the very nature of viruses into account. They have to look to some pre or primitive virus that didn't necessarily, you know, need a host to replicate. And then eventually modern retroviruses came about, something like that. How could they possibly have existed before the cellular host that they depend on so tightly to replicate appeared? That's why it makes more sense that they originated within the cell, within the host. So the escape hypothesis has been what? Retained above the others for the past years, although there are actually no overwhelmingly com um, compelling reasons for its acceptance. See, here's the thing, okay? Is we do have a different starting point, okay? The evolutionary community, they still want to look to IRV sequences as being the ancient remnants of past viral infections, okay? So even though there's some similarities here, there are some differences. I'm just pointing out that the similarities to the Vige hypothesis are rather fascinating, okay? Um, okay, so we're, we're going to kind of transition here into uh, junk DNA in general because we understand that our genome actually has tremendous evidence for biochemical function. Okay, if the junk DNA paradigm is overturned, you know what's overturned with it? You, one could say IRV, the IRV argument, nests within the junk DNA argument. The, by refuting the junk DNA argument, you actually refute pseudogenes, IRV sequences, ALU sequences, you refute it with it. Because the evolutionary model requires genomes of evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils, viral fossils, junk, that would reflect this process of descent with modification over time. That's why they say these hierarchies, these nested hierarchical patterns reflect descent. But we say as creationists that no, these nested hierarchical patterns reflect design. They are hierarchies by design rather than descent. And the differentiating lines of evidence to tell us which model is true and fits reality, what's the most parsimonious explanation comes down to DNA function. If the vast majority of our genome and DNA elements within the genome are functional, then that demonstrates that these hierarchies are there by design and not descent. 
Because remember, when they do phylogenetic systematics, the evolutionists, they assume that all DNA differences are the result of what? Are the result of mutations over time. There are two, that there's a major difference between the origin of genetic diversity between the evolution model and the creation model. The creation model suggests that the majority of DNA diversity is created diversity. The evolutionist looks to the origin of DNA diversity as being the result of mutations over time. Okay, and this is an important point to consider. But what's fascinating is that we actually have amazing evidence for genome-wide biochemical activity or function, okay? Because in 2012, and I've done full presentations on this, so I won't cover it too much. So in a nutshell, and I talk about this in my book in great detail, in a nutshell, in 2012 is when the ENCODE project, they uh, revealed these just remarkable findings, okay? And basically these findings indicated that upwards of 80%, okay, currently it's between 60 and 80%, I believe it's 60% of the genomes transcribed, between 60 and 80% is just generally active, okay? There's some debate on that, but we'll go with 60 to 80%, which is still far too much for the evolutionary community. The evolutionists require basically no more than 10 to 20% functional or else low impact deleterious, nearly neutral deleterious muta mutation accumulation destroys any chance at evolution being true. As a matter of fact, there's been simulations run, okay, in real time that show that even if the genome was only 10% functional, which it's not, it's way more than that, then large scale evolution could not happen because that's 10 low impact, effectively uh, neutral, deleterious mutations accumulating from generation to generation. And that would lead to degeneration, sickness, and extinction. If species cannot persist for millions of years into the future, they could not have persisted for millions of years into the past. Deleterious mutation accumulation, genetic degeneration is a reality. It puts shelf lives on genomes. It proves that biology is young. And it also proves that the geologic column and the fossil record is young. And you may, may be asking me why that is the case. And the reason why it's the case is because biology is reflected in the fossil record because those fossils were once living biological organisms, <laughs> okay? They are testimony to biology and so again, if species cannot persist for millions of years into the future, they could not have persisted for millions of years into the past. Biology is young, and that means extinct biology is young, and so is extant biology is young. So those fossils that supposedly go back millions and millions of years, and you have some living fossils like the horseshoe crab or the coelacanth or the Willemi pine or whatever, okay? Deleterious mutation accumulation puts shelf lives on genomes. So that means the interpretation that this specific organism goes back 500 million years is false because <laughs> genetic degeneration demonstrates that biology today is young. Biology as reflected in the fossil record is also young. Evolution is, it's dead, okay? That alone is a fatal blow to fish to fisherman evolution. Okay, so anyways, it was it was surprising, though, to discover that the genome consists of only about 20,000 genes. This is an estimate. And it wasn't uh, an expected number, put it that way. But what we now know is that a vast portion of the human genome consists of non-coding DNA sequences. You got coding and non-coding DNA sequences. Those are sequences that don't directly code for a protein product, okay? DNA to RNA to protein, the protein product, being the end functional product of, of that process. Transcription, translation. No, you've got DNA to RNA, okay, transcribed in RNA, but then there's functional roles, a variety of functional roles for these RNA products. And this is a major reason why so many in the evolutionary community assume that the human genome constituted useless evolutionary baggage because only a minute portion of the genome actually coded for proteins, while the greater portion of it, the greater, greater portion of it was non-coding DNA sequences, all right, junk DNA. And so they look to shared junk DNA sequences between various organisms, and they conclude common ancestry. But now we know 
that the entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned and the evolutionists hate when I say that, but it's true. And guess what? They hate it because truth is hate to those that hate the truth. And that's the truth. Junk DNA is junk science. Evolutionists, it's time to deal with the facts and deal with the truth. Okay. And the evolutionary community, especially the uh, more well-informed evolutionists understand very clearly that without junk DNA, evolution cannot happen. And that's why they militantly defend junk DNA as still being a fact. Because they know without it, evolution can't be true. And um, this is why they, they defend it adamantly. And this is why they defend their argument that these herb sequences are the ancient vestiges of past viral infections over the course of uh, millions of years of evolutionary history. Okay. So um, anyways, with, with all this amazing activity for uh, uh, the genome that we have, okay, this biochemical activity, the question is to the evolutionists that, that don't want to make any predictions, right? Making testable and falsifiable predictions is the gold standard of science, but the evolutionary community, they don't want to do it. <laughs> Um, and I know why they don't want more egg on their face, but they want to say that most of this activity is spurious. It's just noise and it's just easier for the cell for whatever reason to just transcribe it anyways, for that activity to be there. Well, wait a minute. If this activity was not actually useful or is just noise or the transcription itself was just spurious, spurious transcription. And guess what? Natural selection should have weeded out this genetic baggage millions of years ago. Because this is extremely wasteful of resources and energy for the cell. This is a strong indication that this activity is in fact useful and beneficial. But this brings me to transcription factors, okay? And before I get into it in, in uh, detail, okay, this will be technical here. Um, I do want to go over this, just a basic kind of definition of uh, what, what transcription factors are so the audience can fo follow along, okay? So do you have any transcription factors in your body? I sure hope the answer is yes, because otherwise you're going to have a hard time keeping your cells running. Transcription factors are proteins that regulate the transcription of genes. That is, they're copying into RNA on the way to making a protein. The human body contains many transcription factors. So does the body of a bird, tree, or fungus. Transcription factors help ensure that the right genes are expressed in the right cells of the body at the right time. Control mechanisms. In, in, in Listen, not every single gene is turned on at the same time. That would be death. That would be disease. That would be bad. Okay, there has to be some kind of control mechanism, and we have many types of control mechanisms, including the epigenome. And this all points us back to the forward thinker. Okay, so here's, here's the question. Is transcription factor binding noise, okay, is transcri uh, transcription factor binding, is it noise like the evolutionists want to say? This just massive evidence for genome function and activity. Is, is it just noise or is it actually testimony of functionality? And that's what I want to get into next as we go to, as it's been almost an hour and a half, I am just going to take a two minute break to fill up my water. And as I've been drinking a lot of water, since I've been fighting some allergies today, that means I need a little bit of a bathroom break. So um, standing for truth, we'll be back in two minutes.
All right, we are back, and I am ready for the second portion of this presentation. All right. So the question we left with, I want to leave you guys in suspense, was, I'll just make sure, unmute, okay. All right, here we go. So the question I left everybody in suspense over, uh, suspense over <clears throat> is, is the transcription factor, okay, binding, is it noise or testimony of functionality? Firstly, binding sites. The binding sites for transcription factors are often close to a gene's promoter. However, they can also be found in other parts of the DNA, sometimes very far away from the promoter and still, still affect transcription of the gene. So these binding sites are not necessarily right near each other. They're far away from the promoter and yet they still affect transcription of the gene. They still do their job and they do it well. Okay, so this is an important paper. Um, Genome-wide motif statistics are shaped by DNA binding proteins over evolutionary time. Now, what they did here, Okay, the scientists, they measured binding and um, concluded that we are probably, actually, these are secular scientists dealing with functional binding, not noise. And there is good uh, biochemical reason for this. And uh, this is what I want to touch on, okay? And this specifically has to do with what's called interference. As in, if transcription factors were binding randomly all over the genome, just binding randomly, it's noise, it's spurious. Well, that would actually make a mess. That would gum up the operation of the genome. It would clutter up the interior of, of the genome, of the cell. And if most of the binding was just random binding and just noise, essentially, this would create an interference problem and would consequently just muck up the operations associated with the genome. It would essentially prevent the genome from working properly. The functionality of the genome would not flow properly. It would just be a big mess, okay? Our analysis demonstrates that weak binding sites in genomes are preferentially avoided. A result that holds true across the domains of life. Put another way, we show that the global word composition of each genome has been molded by its DNA binding proteins over the course of evolution. Transcription factors are very important proteins involved in the process of converting or transcribing DNA into RNA. Remember, DNA transcribed into RNA RNA translated into protein, DNA RNA to protein, okay? Transcription factors include a wide number of proteins, excluding RNA polymerase that initiate and regulate the transcription of genes. One distinct feature of transcription factors is that they have DNA binding domains that give them the ability to bind to specific sequences of DNA, of DNA called enhancer or promoter sequences. Some transcription factors bind to a DNA promoter sequence near the transcription start site and help form the transcription initiation complex. Other transcription factors bind to regulatory sequences, such as enhancer sequences, and can either stimulate or repress transcription of the related gene. Regulation of transcription is the most common form of gene control. Again, these control mechanisms that we find in the genomes of living, bio, of living organisms are testimony to the forward thinker because these are forward thinking mechanisms that can only come about through a forward thinker. The action of transcription factors allows for unique expression of each gene in different cell types and during development. Okay, so here's another thing. If these transcription factors were just haphaz haphazardly binding to places within the genome and just not really doing anything, there wouldn't be enough transcription factors available to actually do the binding that is needed for these transcription factors to really properly function, 
since only a certain amount of transcription factors will be produced that can actually be utilized for function for cellular activity. Okay. So it doesn't make any sense that what we're looking at is, is noise. Okay. And, you know, we, we've got many, many functions um, in, in the junk DNA uh, areas. And um, to conclude the last portion, I, what does this all mean, basically? Well, most of the binding measured by the ENCODE project was therefore, we can predict functional binding, not just noise. Okay, these that continue to hold to the junk DNA paradigm, they're just getting desperate in their arguments, in their objections. Okay, because they employ these arguments. They employ this argument that suggests that just most of this transcription taking place or most of the activity is merely spurious. We've gone over several reasons why that's ridiculous, uh, why it's ridiculous to say that it's just nothing more than noise because they have to save the junk DNA paradigm. When you overturn the junk DNA paradigm, you also overturn shared herb sequences as evidence for evolution. Because the evidence, as everybody can see by now, suggests that these are created units of DNA function. Why do we share them with the rest of the biological world for the most part? Because of common design. Biological organisms require DNA elements to have roles and assist and function in embryological development, determining cell types, cell stress responses in the immune system, okay? All these different functional roles that we know uh, ERV sequences are involved in. And again, this whole appeal to noise and um, spurious activity, it doesn't make much sense since we recognize, okay? It's an, it comes down to energy requirements. I could spend all day on why these arguments put forth by people like Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal don't work. And I spent a great deal of time in my book on it, which wasn't addressed. Okay. So transcribing a portion of the genome is actually a very energy intensive process. As you can imagine, every time a nucleotide is being added to a growing RNA chain, you are consuming a great deal of energy. And so these transcripts would just clutter up the interior of the cell if they weren't really doing anything if they were just, if it was just noise that we were looking at, and there was no real operational role. Intuitively, it doesn't make any sense. And there should also be mechanisms that suppress the transcription. And Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, he, he looked at DNA methylation as if that's any help. We have a lot of genes or DNA elements that are turned off, just like the, your backup camera is turned off when you're driving until you need it, then you turn it on when, when you're backing up your car or when you need your spare tire, or if you get in a car accident and your airbag comes in handy. Well, that's what we see with a lot of these DNA elements is they are turned off until they need to be called upon until their job essentially, or their role is actually required. Okay. So that's, if this really was just junk and not there doing anything or not even, or just uh, not even just redundant, Okay, and redundancy is is great in computer code, but these evolutionists want to look to redundancy in the genome and think it's a problem. Think it's a evidence for evolution for some reason. Okay, no, that 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 doesn't that doesn't work. Okay, if if most of this activity is just biochemical noise and not biochemical function, there should be evolutionary processes that would end up suppressing this transcription as an effort to what? Well, obviously to to conserve energy, to preserve resources, important resources, because it would just be a waste of resources and energy for the cell. And that's an incredibly important point that most defenders of evolutionary theory, they don't want to consider. They don't want to consider because they understand that this activity can't actually be, be beneficial activity or functional activity or else they can't take their fish to fishermen. <laughs> okay, so the many functions of, of DNA, nucleoskeletal hypothesis, DNA content determines nuclear volume. The ratio of nuclear volume to cellular uh, volume is a tightly constrained parameter. Uh, a mutational buffer, they maintain 3D structure, regulate histone binding. Um, genome architecture, 
between humans and chimpanzees totally different. Gene expression, so even in similar sequences between chimpanzees and humans, we have differences in regulation and expression. We have epigenome related differences, differences in uh, alternative splicing. So even in the sequences that are similar, there's actually um, differences in, in the way these sequences are expressed or function. And these are differences that the evolutionists can account for. Pseudogenes, we understand, you know, gene regulation, decoy mechanism, code for functional proteins. Um, a lot of these pseudogenes, the, the way they're structured is necessary for their functional roles. That's why they look very similar to their protein coding counterpart. Just like when it comes to these ERV sequences, because the evolutionists want to ask, why do ERV sequences resemble viral genetic material? Well, it just so turns out that one of their many functional roles, okay, one of their many functional responsibilities is that they function or operate in the innate immune system. They perform an antiviral role. They are valuable DNA elements that work considerably in the immune system of their host. Think of your antiviral programs in your computer. They're necessary. Without them, your computer is susceptible to all types of viral invasions. And we have these functional DNA elements that were front-loaded into, into created kinds that work extensively in the immune system. And the way that they systematically exercise their antiviral effect has to do with their what? Has to do with their sequence similarities or sequence resemblances to viral material. Without the nature or structure of the, the endogenous retrovirus, the LTRs, right? The long terminal repeats, the gag, the pole, the ENV. Without the specific design of the ERV sequence, they could not carry out their role in the innate immune system in fighting off bad viruses. They have a very significant job that they need to perform. And therefore, they require these similarities to exogenous uh, retroviruses, to viral material. We should be thanking God they resemble viruses because they work considerably in the immune system. They, they help our immunity. And remember, back to the beginning of this lecture, in the embryo, but also when we're developed in our lifetime, okay? Line signs, X chromosome inactivation, monoallelic gene expression, the signs, uh, stress response, gene regulation, introns, uh, uh, stress response, allow for alternative splicing, herbs, again, antiviral uh, function, tumor suppression, gene regulation. So you know, here's what I really wanted to get to as I kind of wind it down here is um, the evolutionists, right? They'll say, well, you know, natural selection, yeah. Natural selection did not remove this junk. Most of the activity is spurious. You know, mo the, the genome is just mostly, uh, cons it consists of evolutionary leftovers, genomic fossils, viral fossils, and it's just easier to keep around. It's just easier. It's just easier for me to, you know, in my bedroom or my car, just to, it just gets more and more messy, more and more cluttered up. Or, you know, maybe I got a workout machine and I've got just clothes hanging on it or upstairs in my uh, dresser, you know, I've got just shirts and socks and pants that I never wear. And it just gets worse and worse and more and more cluttered. The evolution is saying that's, that's better. That's easier. Just keep all that around. Because here's the thing. Evolutions will never concede. Evolution to them can explain up, down, right, left. Evolutions can explain everything. Essentially, evolution has limitless powers. Mutation plus selection can take pawn scum to people. Evolutionary mechanisms can take a bacteria-like organism into a biologist, a fish into a fisherman, goo into you. But selection, for some reason, because the evolution has said so, can't remove all this junk can't clean up the cell. Just keep around all this junk, useless uh, garbage. But no, the evolutionists will say, as you can see here, 
you know, we, we started off as, as essentially pond scum, some warm little pond somewhere billions of years ago, non-living chemicals managed to evolve into the first self-replicating cell or molecule. So, you know, you got that single celled organism that evolved into the first multi-celled organism, which evolves into a fish which evolves into an amphibian, the expansion of genetic variability, phenotypic complexity, novel body plans, large scale evolution, these large scale changes. Whoops. Amphibian to a reptile, to a monkey. So reptile to mammal. Think of it this way, farm, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, primitive mammals, eventually humans. And humans, you know, look at us. We're doing presentations over the laptop that can be aired to the world. We've built the space shuttle. We've built airplanes. We write symphonies. All through these evolutionary processes can take us from uh, right here. Fish to fisherman, another evolution fairy tale. Time, the god of the evolutionist, right? Time can do anything. And you know what? They can have trillions of years, but guess what? The more years you get, evolutionist, the more extinction and degeneration you get. Because as we pointed out earlier, species can't persist for millions of years into the future because every single rescue mechanism that has been put forth to address the problem of genetic degeneration and genetic entropy has been looked at and systematically destroyed. Truncation selection, synergistic epistasis, mutation count mechanism, purifying selection, super beneficial mutations. You name it, fitness variation, you know, the, these uh, Dan, the Dan, dancer and cardinals of the world, just n nothing but straw man arguments. They try and say that we ignore things like fitness variation and selection and uh, say that refutes our position. When in fact, no, these have all been looked at. They've all been accounted for, especially in Mendel's account, where you've got hundreds to thousands of numerical simulations that look at these things. Even assume that the majority of the genome is junk and you still, it's inevitable, you get genetic degeneration. So you're not going to get your fish to fishermen. I'm sorry, evolutionist. Okay, it's not going to happen. So again, it doesn't work. It's a fairy tale. Just imagine how we can go from a fish to a fisherman, from a single cell like ancestor into a human and a whale over time, okay, through these evolutionary changes. But says selection can't remove all of this genetic baggage. It can take. Goo to you, but it can't remove all of this baggage. It's a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale, okay? Genome functionality. One of the big revelations of the Human Genome Project was that genes that are used together do not necessarily appear near one another in the genome. Remember, we can write books that can be read forwards, but DNA can read both forwards and backwards. And you have multiple overlapping codes. Every other letter, you get another message. Multiple overlapping codes, nested information, multidimensional, massive amounts of meta information. The evolutionists can't account for this. The evolutionists have to explain how this four-dimensional genome with multiple overlapping codes, chock full of meta information came about and, and they can't. The genome is nothing more than millions of years of genetic accidents. See, here's the problem. The genome is polyfunctional and therefore polyconstrained. Because you, you get messages when you read genetic sequences, both forwards and backwards in every other letter, let's say, and then you have encrypted messages too. But guess what? One mutation, whether it's uh, you know a substitution or whether it's a single point mutation, whether it's a deletion, okay? Whether it's a duplication, frame shift, inversion, you name it. Whatever mutation it is, because we have these multiple overlapping codes and the genome is polyfunctional, one mutation, one mistake, is going to mess up one of the messages, if not all the messages. It's a lot easier to break a gene down than actually build it up. Okay? So these mutations mess up these messages that are embedded within the genetic code. They don't make things better. The genome uh, claims like it's just junk, 
and the genome is nothing more than millions of years of genetic accidents were raised. This did not last long. However, for once people started looking into how the genome is organized in the nucleus, they realized that not only does each chromosome have a specified position in the nucleus, but genes that are used together are generally found next to each other in 3D space, even when they are found on different chromosomes. Got paper after paper. If you get my book, which I highly recommend, got copies here, copies there, it is just packed with sources from the secular literature, okay? Junk DNA overturned, paper after paper. Scientists discover a role for junk DNA. Redundancy of the genetic code enables translational pausing. We're actually finding out that the, the third position codon variation, okay? We're actually finding out that this third position doesn't just tolerate error. It's not just redundant, but actually it assists in information flow as well. I mean, we have, it's science fiction on the molecular level. 40 years ago, it was what? One gene, one, one, um, one gene, one protein, one function. Now it's one protein can have multiple functions. This phenomenon called protein moonlighting. So where these uh, evolutionists oftentimes want to look at these genetic markers or these DNA level hierarchies, right? These ATP synthase proteins and say, you know, why are there differences between different creatures? Why not just the same? But in fact, we actually have these the multifunctional roles associated with a lot of these genes or proteins or genetic markers where we have cell optimization, information flow, which again shows hierarchies by design and not descent, which is where we can make some really fascinating predictions where it's not just one functional role, it's multiple functional roles. Pseudogene functionality. Um, multiple retro pseudogenes from pluripotent, we talked about that earlier, cell-specific gene expression indicates a potential signature for novel gene identification. And, you know, you can read these all for yourself. Together, these findings attribute a novel biological role to express pseudogenes as they regulate coding gene expression and reveal a non-coding function for mRNAs. We talk a lot about gene regulation, gene expression. Well, basically gene regulation is how a cell controls which genes. Remember these control mechanisms that are necessary. Great forward thinking is how a cell controls which genes out of the many genes in its genome are turned on or expressed. Okay, regulating where, when, and how gene products are expressed, going from DNA to a functional product, RNA product, or polypeptide slash protein product is gene expression. Okay, gene expression and gene regulation. The third dimension, remember we have this four dimensional genome. The third dimension deals with how the shape of the DNA molecule affects the expression and control of different genes. We have learned that sections of DNA that are buried deep within the coiled up DNA cannot be activated easily. So genes that are used often are generally easily accessible. Thus, when God wrote out the information in the genome along uh, that one dimensional strand, he intentionally put things in a certain order so that they would be in, in the correct place when the DNA was folded into 3D shape. Evolutionists have looked to um, I think it was Den uh, Dr. Dennis Venema, gene order along chromosomes. And um, the similarities between different creatures, and I think in technical terms, it's called syntony. When it turns out that gene order along chromosomes, again, <laughs> are there for purposeful reasons, functional reasons. The genome is a multi-dimensional operating system for an ultra complex biological computer with built-in error correcting and self-modification codes. Show us evolutionists how this can come about through naturalistic processes. There are multiple overlapping DNA codes, RNA codes, and structural codes. There are DNA genes and RNA genes. The genome was designed with a large amount of redundancy, functional redundancy on purpose by a highly intelligent being who used sound engineering principles during its construction. Despite the redundancy, it displays an amazing degree of compactness as a mere 22,000 or so protein coding genes co combinatorially create several hundred thousand distinct proteins. <laughs> Again, 22,000 or so protein coding genes combinatorially, that's a hard word to say, create several hundred 
thousand distinct proteins. That is fascinating. I have a challenge for the evolutionists. This is Dr. Rob Carter who uh, wrote this article. Explain the origin of the genome. Charles Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Well, guess what? The four-dimensional genome with multiple overlapping codes and chock full of meta information completely breaks down his theory. Okay, completely breaks down his theory. Now, again, we're going to go back to the structure or the properties of a nerve sequence, okay? Because I pointed out how they're absolutely necessary when considering many of their just fundamental functional roles. And specifically here in this paper, switching sides, how endogenous retroviruses protect us from viral infections from uh, 2021. These herb sequences aid in the immune system and they battle off viral infections, okay? And their ability to protect against exogenous retroviruses, bad viruses that are, that are invading the cell that comprises these functional DNA elements that assist in the immune system, all right? Well, it turns out that their ability explains why they look the way they do. Not to mention the fact that a lot of these are mobile elements. And so they need their, their specific structure. They require the integrase, the uh, reverse transcriptase in order to move around the genome in the first place. All right, so herbs actually block the ability of the exogenous retrovirus to infect. So these exogenous retroviruses, okay, they may infect critical tissues. And the herbs are intended to stop this and even more so, stop the possible endogenization of the herbs, of the uh, exogenous retroviruses. Stop them from invading the germ cell line and being passed down vertically and becoming an endogenous retrovirus. And even if they become an endogenous retrovirus and they have not been, let's say, um, you know, destroyed or cleaned up through mutations, like the evolutionist likes to say, the pre-existing fixed herb sequences that are functional are going to act and function to get rid of those unfixed endogenous retroviruses that they don't essentially spread, okay? And, and become uh, more and more damaging. So again, the herbs are just functional in so many ways, the immune system, cell stress responses. And this is just an amazing design feature that presents a substantial problem to those that wanna use these functional DNA elements as evidence for common descent by saying that they're the ancient vestiges of past viral infections. I'm sorry, they're not. Okay. And as I pointed out earlier, the re retroviruses have RNA as their genetic material and they are reverse transcribed into DNA. And that DNA can become integrated into the genome. But some ERVs are mobile elements, the retro, retro transposons. They can move around and they can make copies of themselves and insert throughout the genome. And where the evolutionists want to look to these signatures of retrotransposition and say this is evidence of invasion from outside, <laughs> retrotranspositioning is happening on the inside and leaving those same signatures. It's not evidence for common descent, large scale evolution, fish to fisherman evolution. Okay. This mobility. As a matter of fact, one of their functional roles, it looks like this mobility can disrupt the incorporation of retroviral DNA into the genome. So there's just a lot of protecting going on, safeguarding going on in the genome from the invasion of bad viruses, of retroviruses. And again, these are just a few of the reasons, tumor suppression too. The fact that expressed herbs in tumor cells can allow the immune system to add more destruction to that cell. And it's a combined effort between the guardian, the superhero of the genome, the P53 protein, okay? Between the herb and the P53. And I talk about this in great detail in my book. All of these reasons explain exactly why the herb elements look the way they do. 
It's not evidence for evolution. Long disregarded as junk DNA or genomic dark matter. Endogenous retroviruses have turned out to represent what? Important components of the antiviral uh, immune system. This is the evolutionist. This is a secular paper admitting this. Not only regulate cellular immune activation, but may even directly target invading viral pathogens. The role of herbs as regulators of antiviral gene expression. And their argument about, oh, co-option, it's fanciful storytelling. Okay, there's no empirical evidence. They've never once, Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal admitted that no, and it took them years to finally admit it. Usually they say in debates, well, I don't know. I got to go look into it, hoping that, you know, a PhD virologist like Dan would, would show them the evidence. But he admitted, no, we've never seen a non-functional endogenous retrovirus a not, a going from not functional to something extremely or critically functional in the genome in terms of embryological development, determining cell types, gene regulation, gene expression tumor suppression, antiviral role, roles, okay? Cell stress responses, no, we've never seen it. So anytime I see their story about how this is possible, well, they already have the abilities, you know, pre-existing, the exogenous retroviruses. So again, or, you know, they'll say that, um, again, they'll argue that the herb elements, that they can contribute new genes. They can contribute to the function of the host. They can co contribute new genes like syncytin. Okay. And it, it's all storytelling. There's no empirical evidence. They can't show you a technical paper, again, of even the altering of a pre-existing function of an exogenous retrovirus when it infects through the germ cell line, gets passed on vertically, and eventually the infectious part of it is eliminated. Show us where they now become functional in the embryo to the point where we couldn't exist if we didn't have them. No, they don't have the evidence. It's just more Irv story time from the Evos. And I say, cool story, bro, because that's all they got is a, is a story. Okay. The nested hierarchies don't work. When you understand that these are created units of DNA function, and we understand that it's obvious that God created the biological world hierarchically. Right? We observe nested hierarchical patterns all throughout the living world. Yes, humans and chimpanzees share more in terms of genetics, physiology, morphology, and anatomy, okay, between each other than a human and a lizard. Okay, we can group, we as humans group things all the time. We, we, we group books, movies, and you can even have groups within groups patterns. You know, in my library upstairs, I have Christian books, and I have those grouped together. And within Christian books, you can have subcategories, group, other groups, soteriology, books about the nature of God, okay? C creation evolution it can fit within that category. We group cars all the time. So modes of transportation fit a nested hierarchical pattern, okay? If IRV sequences are created units of DNA function, it's no surprise that we share more. Notice this. The human and the chimpanzees would share more of these IRV sequences than a human and a mouse. That's given because we share more anatomically, morphologically, physiology with the chimpanzee anyways. So this shouldn't be. So all you have to do is just stand back and sp focus specifically on humans and chimpanzees here. We, we as humans are far, far more like the chimpanzees than we are to dogs and fish or a mouse. We as humans are far more like chimpanzees than we are to a bacteria, okay? There's no doubting the fact that the creation order can be grouped into a hierarchy. And it just reflects God's hierarchical nature. Now, even though we, from the separate uh, ancestry model perspective, we would reject any, any position that says humans and chimpanzees are related, I don't have an issue admitting that it of, by definition, when God created, he had to create some creatures more similar to other creatures and more different to other creatures. And, you know, it's it's a circular argument. It's assume evolution to prove evolution because let's say there was no chimpanzees. Let's say there was no apes right here, the great apes. Well, then they would just say, well, we're closest to the old world monkeys or, or stick within the great apes. Let's say there was no chimpanzees or bonobos. Then they would just say, well, humans are most similar to 
uh, a gorilla. And so you go down the line, you got old world monkeys, new world monkeys. Okay. All the way down to lemurs, down to lizards, nested hierarchy. Either way, there's always going to be a creature that we are most similar to. And there's going to be creatures that we are less similar to just like modes of transportation. Okay. Our model suggests that since the Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God, there must be something about us that reflects the divine. And so maybe we, maybe we can get a sense for how God created the biological world based on the way we design things. So when these people like Dr. Dan Stern, Cardinal in his review want to say, and just hand wave all this evidence away by saying, oh, cars don't reproduce. Well, firstly, adding reproduction adds complexity and adds more problems for evolutionary theory because he believes that whales and pine trees and strawberries are related through common ancestry, okay? So he's trying to say if cars could reproduce, then apparently that's less complex. No, that's more complex. And that's more evidence for amazing design and forethought and forethinking. It's a ridiculous argument, but it also is a straw man argument. It misrepresents our position because again, for the millionth time, if we are created in the image of God, then we have some expectations. There must be something about us that reflects the divine. And so maybe we can get a sense for how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. And it just so turned out, which the evolutionists have to say it's a coincidence, that we build in homologous patterns. We build in nested hierarchical patterns. Why is a sedan more like an SUV than both a sedan and an SUV are to an airplane? All of the, even when you bring in unpowered vehicles, okay, these are all vehicles that are built to, to get you from one place to another. And all these vehicles can be nested together, okay? An unpowered vehicle is not powered by an engine, but it is still <laughs> designed and built to get you from one place to another in the same way that a plane is designed to get you from one place to another and a truck. Okay, sedans and hatchbacks can be grouped together because they share more than they would with a tractor trailer. But you can bring in a tractor trailer with the sedans and hatchbacks and SUVs because they all share more with each other than they do with a boat. Okay, but you're always going to find degrees of hierarchies. You can find degrees of hierarchies in the metals used, in the paints, in, in the rubbers. So it's, it's not evidence for evolution. Design means of transportation easily fit a relative hierarchical pattern. This fact is unequivocal. Sedans resemble SUVs more than they resemble tractor trailers, and all three vehicles have more in common than do sedans and amphibious assault vehicles. The latter two vehicles have more in common with one another than with submarines, and this simple pattern matches the type of hierarchy that we see in biology. But then they don't want to talk about all the contradictions or inconsistencies in the hierarchy, like orphan genes have no consistent hierarchy. The fact that the human Y chromosome and the gorilla Y chromosome are more like each other than the human and the chimpanzee Y chromosome. There's herb sequences that are more similar between humans and gorillas than between humans and um, chimpanzees or incomplete lineage sorting or um, convergent evolution. Every time convergent evolution is invoked, it is an admittance into the lack of uniqueness of the universal phylogenetic tree. So again, homologous patterns, okay? Hundreds and hundreds of similarities between all kinds of modes of transportation. You have sedans that are designed by manufacturing companies on different continents, and yet they all share features. Does this mean that they all descend from a common Arctic ancestor because they have four tires, windshields, doors on the sides, the sedans are built from a, a certain height from the ground, S steering wheels. No, it's good design. It's common design. Notice this. As we have summarized in this review, Herves, earlier we talked about Herv H. We also talked about Herv K, okay, and how the Herv K helps embryos develop this built-in immune system that keeps them safe that keeps them safeguarded even before they develop antibodies to pathogens in the outside world. Um, we talked about how HERV H strongly influences our growth, development, and our genetic code. 
I mean, this is just amazing stuff that we're seeing here. So notice this, herbs appear to play important roles in physiology, fetal development, and human evolution. And this is the last thing I want to say. We're coming at the two hour mark and I'm losing my voice here. So um, I'm going to do a second part to this because I still have a ton to get through. If the accidental infection of a mammalian ancestor by an exogenous retrovirus had never occurred, the placenta and the mammals that produce it, including humans, would have never existed. And this is just the start of it, guys. As you can see here, paper after paper, beneficial role of human endogenous retroviruses. Retroviral promoters in the human genome. Scientists identify new beneficial function of endogenous retroviruses and immune response. And part two, I'm going to address in great detail, comprehensively, the uh, shared mutagenic discrepancies, the shared mutations, so-called, in the herb sequences and elements themselves that apparently followed into hierarchical patterns. We're going to touch on that in great detail as well. So, wow, that was two hours of nonstop talking. And uh, yeah, just over the two hour mark. So that was my goal, actually. I said, I'm going to do this for two hours. And that was a ton of information. So guys, please share this content around because the truth is important. And if you have not yet picked up the endogenous retrovirus handbook, please do. God bless everybody. Standing for truth.